Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. What a privilege to be in your house this morning. Lord, we do thank you for the beauty that is all around us. We thank you so much. We thank you that people here are safe today. We thank you for all the beauty that you've, you're just doing in our lives. Lord, I just thank you so much. It's so beautiful. I run out of words, Lord. It's just so cool. And I thank you. Be with me now, Lord, as we, we impart the word and break the bread to eat today. And we thank you so much for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We're in Colossians. We got some final practicals to do today. How fun. But last week, we had a word to, the, to slaves and lords. We broke it down into a word for employees and bosses. Last week, we talked about a good work attitude. How to think like you're supposed to when you're at work. How to have a good job attitude and know why you're doing it. To work for the proper reasons. Why are you working there? What are you doing? Having a proper attitude is really important. The big issue is taking Jesus with you. Now, I've been reading a whole bunch of different things about different practicals that people write in these books about different things, and it is amazing. They have very good stuff in their, in their books. I just don't see that they teach people to have that personal walk with Jesus where he's standing right there. And it seems like that's a, a, uh, a thing that's missing. The people are not catching that, you know, all we are is, if all we are is just Christians who are people who are just trying to keep a good attitude and trying to do things for a good reason and just, just try to keep, man, that is so lame. What's the difference that we have? The difference we have is this personal relationship where the Holy Spirit lives in us and we take Jesus with us everywhere we go. And we have a walk with the Father, no matter what. We can access the very throne room of God all day long. You'd think we would have it together. But the big deal is wherever your job is, there's darkness. Anybody figured that part out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that means what? You're the light in that darkness. Man, you've got to know your calling there. And also being a good boss, being the one who does take care of the people who are underneath you. You've got to be good to them. You've got to know how to lead correctly. Um, all of them, both employee or boss, we are accountable before our Lord. We've got to know that everything is under structure of authority. Authority does just about everything in the Word. Work is our opportunity to be like Jesus in the eyes of everybody. Isn't that fun? So the verses we had last, last week was slaves, verses 22 and 20 through 25 of chapter 3. Slaves, obey the Lord's according to flesh in all respects, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatever you may do, work from the soul as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ, but the one doing wrong will receive what he did wrong, and there is no partiality. And then chapter 4, verse 1, Lords, give what is just and equal to the slaves, knowing that you have a Lord in heaven also. Okay? Now, that brings us right into chapter 4, verse 2. Now, as is per normal, the way Paul does things, is he has a theme that he's working through his entire letter, and he gets down to the end, and he throws a bunch of end time, ending practicals, little advice that he says, uh, don't, no, do this and do this and do this and do this. And so that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to do the final practicals, the little things that he throws at the end. They are deeper than most people think. They aren't just, and just go out and be, behave yourself. You know, they're deeper than that. Chapter 2, uh, verse 2 says, Steadfastly continue in prayer, watching in it with thanksgiving. Now that's simple. Isn't that just simple? Steadfastly continue with prayer. Watching in it with thanksgiving. Isn't that simple? You know how little we do that? 
You know, steadfastly. The word steadfastly is kind of fun in the Greek. It's proskartereo. It means to persevere and to do so continually. Now, persevering, you know, uh, means that there's adversity. You don't have to persevere when there's nothing that's a problem. But if there's a problem, it's going to take persevering. You're going to have to push through. Now, and I've heard this sentence said almost all my life, we have to push through in prayer. Push through in prayer. And I get that. Because you're praying about something, but until you push through, until you're praying about it and understand what he wants to do, praying, being consistent, being persistent, being after, to get after this thing and find out what it is. When I was growing up, we had a little issue with prayer. It bothered me when I watched people pray, and the most thing they did was whine and state the problem. Oh, Lord, it's so bad. Oh, Lord, my paycheck just does not cover all the pills. Oh, Lord, I just don't know what I'm going to do. That's not steadfastly pushing through. That's succumbing to. That's being beat up by. Okay? I, that's just, that just never did cut it to me. I said, to people, let's go pray together. Not like that. No, like there's got to be better things for us to do than to sit around and whine together. This isn't Colorado wine country, you know. You want some cheese with that wine? You know, come on. And just, that's not prayer. This steadfastly continuing in prayer shows that there's a perseverance. We're pushing through to get this final result. Now, what are we pushing through against? And this is one of those fun little deals for me. I have found, that, boy, there's a lot of teaching out there about can't you wait with me at least, at least one hour? And the big deal about spending one hour with Jesus, one hour of prayer a day. Can you, can't you just even spend an hour, which is taking things completely out of context because that wasn't what he's talking about at all. Are we trying to log time? Are we trying to punch in a punch clock and say we've logged in so much time? No, that's not the issue. What is it we're trying to do? What are we trying for? Can you spend an hour in prayer? Listen, I'll tell you something. When I spend an hour in prayer, that means about 50 minutes of that is me just trying to get my flesh under control and about 10 minutes of real good prayer. Anybody relating to me on this one? Okay, what is perseverance? Perseverance is pushing through until I get me out of the way. Perseverance is pushing through until I get my bad attitude straight. Perseverance is me getting my agenda off. Anybody relating to any part of this? Okay, because we go into prayer with an agenda, don't we? Yes. Let's see. Him, God, me, grunt. What part of that means we have an agenda? Okay. Because it's usually me, Because it's usually yeah. me, God, him, grunt. Uh, how's that working out for you? Never. Not too good. Okay, he's the mighty God we serve, and we should come and come and try to find out what is his agenda. Lord, what do you want to do? Okay? Because, listen, I've given my opinion to him, and you can almost hear him say, hmm, nice opinion. Now you want the truth? Pros cartereo, to persevere steadfastly. And then it says, Continue in prayer. Now, by the way, that proskartereo is one word. Steadfastly continue. Push, or push persevere. Pers push through. Find this thing. Prosuke, relational prayer. Remember we've talked about this out of Philippians where it says, with prayer, petition, and supplication, or prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, being the three forms of prayer in Philippians 6, 4. The other kind of prayer is intercession. All of those are interesting, okay? What is petition? Asking for things. What is thanksgiving? Thanking for things. Or thanking for what has been done. Being thankful and praising. What is intercession? Interceding for somebody else on their behalf. Okay? All of those are prayer. Then what the heck is prayer? When it says do these things with prayer, petition, thanksgiving, and intercession. Then prayer is listed as a form of prayer. What's prayer? Prayer is that relational thing to where you and Jesus are just talking and you're building relationship. You're not asking for anything. You're not thanking him for anything. You're not praying about somebody else. It's just you and him building relationship. 
You know how hard it is to pray without asking for anything? No. No, the issue is that we've got to know that there's just building the relationship. Okay, now if my kids come to me and all they do is ask for things, and they come to me and all they wanted was something. Dad, I want this, I want this, Dad, I want this, I want this. Do you know how long that conversation is going to last? <laughs> You're done. No, that's just sitting there, Just that's mostly whining, which is what most prayer is. We plug in the thing and God's supposed to just do his thing. That's not relationship. That's not getting caught talking to him. Now, if I, if I had in, in my marriage, all I did was ask her for things, we would not have lasted 40 years, guaranteed. No, you beat that guy now. Oh, yeah, easy. Okay? <laughs> because it's relational. Well, what have you ever, when have you ever just sat and said, well, Lord, what do you think? Lord, what about, you know, what's, what, what, what's, hey, you know, let's talk back and forth. Let's build relationship. You know, that, that's prayer. This is steadfastly continue in prayer. Steadfastly continue in that relationship where you're having with him, where you talk with him back and forth. You actually listen and obey. Where actually you're, you're finding out what his opinion is and flowing with that. Last time you got angry, did you stop to find out what the Lord was saying? <laughs> because we know better, huh? All you had to do is stop for a second and, Lord, what do you say? Lord, what's going on? What would have happened if you had stopped to listen to what the Lord was saying? What, what would happen to your anger after you repented? <laughs> it's important. Now, steadfastly continue in prayer. We can stop right there and know that we've uh, got a word from God to change how we're doing stuff. We've got to start continuing pushing for that relationship. That's what I was saying before, is that I have all these different things. People talk about what things are, but where's the relationship with Jesus? When they stop and to ask him. Well, this steadfastly continuing in prayer is exactly it. Persevere. If you have issues at work, talk to him about those issues at work. If you have issues at home, talk to him about those issues at home. Not just asking about them. Lord, take this. Lord, do this. Lord, do this. Go over five steps, turn left, and go over and just, you know, and just, no. Why don't you just listen and ask him what's going on with it? If we'd only learn that, <laughs> that it is faster and easier. You know, my dad used to say, how come there's never enough time to do something right, but always enough time to do it over? Then it says watching in it. Now, this word watching is very, very interesting in the Greek, especially for one person in this room. Huh. You know where we're going with this, right? Okay. The Greek word for watching is the word Gregoreo. <laughs> so good old Greg has his name got right straight out of the Greek, and it means to have a military watch to stay awake, to be on watch, to pay attention to. It is Gregory, right? <laughs> so his name is Gregory anyway, so that's where you got it. Okay, that's where it comes from, right there. It means to watch, to be on military watch. Now, for those of you who have never been in the military, okay, which is most of us, watch is not a funny thing. If you're on watch duty, you had better be awake. It used to be a capital offense if you fell asleep on watch capital offense. It was during the war. During the war, if they caught you sleeping on guard duty, they executed you. Capital offense. You, it's, not, it's not funny. It's a very extremely serious thing to have somebody on watch. What's going on? Okay? And you see all these movies, you know, usually the cowboy movies. Okay, well, you got first watch. And then they see this guy, and he's all hunkered down and cold, and he's just trying to stay awake and nods off. And the bad guys come in, okay? Happens so often in so many movies, okay? But that's not watching. Where else did Jesus use this word? In the garden. Can you not watch with me? 
That's interesting. Stay awake. Pay attention to what's going on. Pray, because there's a lot of stuff happening. The government was completely disru disruptive. The whole spirit realm was in a turmoil. And he's telling these guys, watch. Stay awake. Look at what's happening. And he went, now, right now in today's world, we need to be watching more than ever. There's stuff happening. There's stuff happening right around us that, man, we better be paying attention. Okay? Very soon, we're going to be very held accountable for some very big stuff that's happening. And, and I say all these things about, well, invest this way. Invest this. Invest what? I got a buck. You know, I don't have the money to invest in. What's going to happen? Oh, well, the Lord's got it taken care of. He, all we have to do is trust Him. He's going to take care of things. It's going to be very important. But that doesn't mean we have thing to do. We have to watch. We have to pay attention to what's going on. We have to do what we can do. Do what the Lord has shown us to do. There's a lot of things we're doing. Now this is one of the reasons why I have that four foot garden going over in the Redemption Building. And for those of you who haven't seen it, go over and take a gander at it. It's really cool. It is what is it? it's a barrel with a bunch of holes all the way around it, filled up with potting soil and different things, and it has a bunch of worms in it, and it has a tube down the middle, it has compost, and we're just going to start growing a whole bunch of stuff in a four-foot place. Okay? Why? Because I think we need to. I think we need to keep an eye on the food situation. Okay? Water situation. We need to talk about that here one of these days. Right now, we seem to have plenty. Okay? <laughs> steadfastly continue in prayer, watching in it with thanksgiving. Now, there's the thanksgiving. I didn't put that up. That's the Eucharistia. You guys know that. We've been talking about thanksgiving a whole bunch, watching in it with thanksgiving. But the issue is thanksgiving, not whining. Whining, there is no thanks in whining. We have got to see what is happening correctly. Now, look at this verse. Steadfastly continue in prayer, watching in it with thanksgiving. Man, he's telling them the world is falling apart. Things are going bad. You understand that Paul had not been killed yet. What's the persecution happening? Well, he's in Rome. He's already started the persecution. He's already started being part of the persecution. Churches are starting being persecuted all over the place, and he's telling them now steadfastly continue in prayer. He's telling this church in Colossae, you guys better pay attention because it's all coming down. Watch. Watch for it. Guys, you got to pay attention. This isn't about me paying attention. It's about all of us paying attention. Spiritual awareness is where we have to be. Then it goes into verse 3 and it says, praying together about us also. Now this is kind of interesting, about us also. In other words, you're praying about all sorts of things, but there's something else you need to be praying about. Pray about us also. That, and he sp sp states what he wants them to pray about. That God may open to us a door of the word to speak the mystery of Christ on account of which thing, which I also have been bound. He says, Tom, you need to talk to the Father about us. Us. Now, this is kind of a, an interesting little thing. Okay, so, Di, I want you to be praying about us over here. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, Di, I need you to be praying about us. It isn't about them just praying for Paul and his team. They, Paul and his team are not the only ones in ministry. That's right. Who else is in ministry? All the people in Colossae. He says, now you need to be praying about us, all of us. And when people say, well, Paul's really, he wants everybody to pray for him so that he can get out there and preach the word. Yes, but that's not the total on this thing. He's wanting them to pray for all of the ministers that they might have an open door to speak the word. You understand that word us is huge. Praying together about us also. Us, all doing the stuff that God may open to us a door of the word. Now, I am a, not a big proponent of open door, closed door, finding out the will of God. Well, that was an open door, so we went through it. Groovy. Oh, the door just shut, so we can't go. Wait a minute. 
open door, closed door, is that the will of God? And when, when it's God's will, the door opens. When God's will, the door shuts. You are leaving out a whole entity here. How about an enemy who's trying to shut the door on you? Now, what happens if the door that's being shut, God said, go through anyway, and the door is shut? Wait a minute, that's when you have to steadfastly persevere, huh? you got to push through. God said to do something. And you say, but in the natural, the door shut in the subnatural. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, does it? You're going to have to break through this thing. This, so this open door, closed door thing is kind of a tricky deal. Okay? That's just putting out a fleece. Listen, why don't you just ask him straight and let him talk to you instead of doing all this manufactured, you know, if I can get four angels to dance on the head of this pin, then I'll know God wants me to do this. Okay? <laughs> I, what? What are you talking about, you know? All right. Open door, closed door. That God may open to us the door of the word. Okay? He, and what he's asking for, he says, I want to be able to see the opportunities when God shows them to us. That he open up the door and give me opportunities to go in other places. Now, where had he been? Where is he now? He's in the praetorium. I mean, he's, he is held captive in Rome, chained to a guard, probably. We're not sure about that, but we know that that was a common way that they did that. He may have just been in a house with a guard living with him. Okay? Maybe they chained him at night. I don't know. It's just one of those deals, but he does say he's in chains. Okay? You chained to the kitchen table? <laughs> you know, we don't know how all this functioned. We do know that he was saying, now open a door. Now, when he talks in some of these other books, he says, hey, here's some people who are saying hello to you. These are the people of Caesar's house. He had won people to Jesus who were part of Caesar's house. He was getting soldiers born again. They kept bringing him soldiers to tie him up, I mean, to, to be chained up to him. And so he would sit there and say, Groovy, I have you with me all day, and you can't leave. <laughs> you know? You are, you're going to get it. You're going to get yours right here. I just, so God may open a door to, a, uh, open to us a door of the word, okay? Now, this is very important. It's a door of the word. I saw a T-shirt. I was walking through the T-shirts, and I, I love looking at the T-shirts because there's some of the funniest stuff up there. Anyway, there was another shirt there that I have a problem with, and I've heard this so many times, and it says, at all times witness, but if necessary, use words. Yeah, right. And that, that has given more people an excuse not to say anything. And I don't like that. Why? Because we're having an open door of the word. The word needs to be spoken to people. Okay, when Mary was talking about, hey, they kept running into this Russian couple on the trails down there, okay? Cool. Pretty soon, boom, she opens up the word. It was an opportunity, a door had opened for her to speak the word. It was perfect, okay? That's how it works. That's what I'm looking at. That's the exact same. Paul is saying, praying together about us also that God may open to us a door of the word to speak the mystery of Christ. What is the mystery of the ages? <laughs> All together now. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I got some people trained here. The mystery of the ages is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That was earlier in, in Colossians as we discovered that. And he's saying, now I want to be able to speak the mystery of Christ. What's the mystery of Christ? I don't know that he's up there somewhere in some kind of la la land, and I don't know this all. Is, no, what's the mystery? The mystery is Christ can be in you. The mystery of the ages is there's hope for him to manifest through you, that God can manifest through you. That's the glory. What is the mystery of the ages? Christ in you, the hope of the manifestation of his presence. And yet, we think of witnessing as us out there trying to beat down those bad people to quit doing the bad stuff. Why don't we give them a vision of who they could be? Okay? That's really cool. Persecution because of the message. He says, speak the mystery of Christ, on account of which I have been bound. I keep going around telling people that Christ can be in you, and look what happened. Now I'm in chains. However, that's why I'm praying that you open a door of opportunity <laughs> so I can be out there. 
talking. Okay, guys, it's true about all of us, okay? Now, what happens if we start praying that all of us have an open door of opportunity to speak the mystery of the ages? You see, you want to start praying for me that I have an opportunity to go out and speak? It goes both ways. Um, I know that churches are in jeopardy, okay? Well, they're in jeopardy from a bunch of different things. They're in jeopardy because the community doesn't want them. Why? Churches do good things for communities. People say, oh, they just, you know, whatever. I don't know that why people want them down. They just, I hear Christians saying that are anti-church, Christians who are anti-church. That just bothers me. That just boggles my mind. Because why would we do that? We need to be together. We need to get, this is a valuable thing that we do. Okay, there's churches being closed down all over the place. The fact is they're saying now that there's a very shortage of pastors. I'm going, really? I'm 5'9". That's not too shortage. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Verse 4. That I may make it clear as I ought to speak. Now, this is something that is really important. Paul is saying, I want you guys to be praying for us, but I want you to be praying for me that I may make it clear. This is always the concern. This is always the concern. Uh, do people understand what I'm saying? I always, that's why I'm always asking, does it make sense? Hello, are you with me? Because I've got to see the light shine up in your eyes. It's important that I learn how to, I know how to communicate, and the same thing for you. I want you to be able to communicate so that people's eyes light up. But the issue is, we all need to make what we say clear. Practice what you're saying. Practice why you're saying it. Practice, look at people, and don't use the generic words. You know, that thing that we're trying to, you know, that doesn't communicate. Just say, learn to communicate so that people understand what it is you're trying to say. Uh, a while back, I gave you homework. It was kind of interesting to listen to you people try to explain your homework. What's the difference between mercy and grace? I got a lot of, well, it's a, kind of a, you know, it's, a, it's just kind of a thing, you know, that's kind of, you know, because one is different than the other one. You know, it's kind of a, you know, because mercy's mercy and like grace is like, what's grace? So uh, <laughs> explain it to me. You know, it's not easy. No, it's not. It's not easy. For one, it's not easy coming up with a definition of what grace is without using the old generics. Okay? It's just kind of fun. <laughs> so, do they understand what I'm saying? Is there a way of saying it better? I'm continually li listening to ways of, and sometimes somebody will say something, ooh, I like that. That said it better. And I, I adapt that, so I like to use that. Am I bold enough or too timid? This isn't just for me. This is for you guys, too. Are you bold enough or too timid? See, learn how to be more bold. Don't be timid, okay? Um, I know one of the ways that I can immediately see who's timid and who's not timid by having you come up and use the microphone. I know, but I've had to train people, but the first thing they do with the microphone is they put it down, down here, and it doesn't work down there around your belt, okay? <laughs> microphone has got to be within a couple inches of your mouth. It's got to be up here. Okay, why do people, well, they're timid. Well, they, oh, I don't like the way my voice sounds. doesn't matter what you like or don't like. You have a message to give, and you must give it. And the only way you're going to give it is by putting it on a microphone so people can hear it. Okay? I, I don't like the sound of my voice. I don't like listening to myself. Okay? I hear it, and I go, really? I sound like that? Everybody goes, yeah. But then again, you sound like you, and you don't like it very much either. Okay? So it's a different thing. Get used to it. Be bold. It must be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I've got to make sure the Holy Spirit is speaking. Amen. I've got to make sure that is happening. Okay? That means what? I have to learn what it feels like to be under the anointing and what it feels like to not be under the anointing. You do too. This is a very important deal is when you go to talk, when you can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and know that he is speaking through you. Yes. Learn how to have a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Paul is concerned about this. 
He says, man, I've got to do this right. Pray for me that I speak right. And he had a problem. He was timid. And it says this in Scripture. He says, when I'm with you, I'm like, I'm timid. But when I'm away from you, I'm bold. And when I write, I have boldness. Well, I, I under, you understand. You can write very boldly. And then send the letter off. That'll learn them. Some people do it. Yeah, so, you know. And so I have learned I don't write hardly anything and give it to somebody because they can misread it. They can use it as documentation of what you just said, and they'll keep it forever, and there's no way to repent. Now, I don't write things down. I don't send letters to people very easily. Very, very careful about that. Verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards the ones outside redeeming the time. Now, you know, before I get there, let's go back to this. I need you to hear me and very, very carefully hear me. We don't know what's going to happen to the future of this church. We don't know. One day at a time is the way we're living. Okay? What happens if this church closes? What would happen? Simple. This church cannot close. It can just disperse. That's right. Amen. That's right. Well, okay. You've been trained and trained and trained and trained in the word. You know what it says. You know how to describe certain things. You know more about ministry than most churches do. You know an awful lot. So what has the Lord been preparing? If nothing else, he's been preparing you to become the catalyst to going into churches and affecting a change. Amen. Bringing the word of God to people, bringing ministry to people, bringing hope to people, bringing, being out there doing the stuff. This all will make a lot more sense to you when all of a sudden you're the one out there being the one minister in a crowd of people. So I'm praying for you that a door of opportunity may be opened. Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom toward the ones outside, redeeming the time. Continual step by step. Wisdom must be a step by step thing. You know, you can't be wise for five minutes and a complete fool for ten and expect them to see the wisdom. Continual step by step wisdom. It says walk in wisdom. Now, walking, we're, we're really good at it. I mean, everybody here walked in here today. Okay, well, how do you do that? Well, you know, you kind of kind of lean forward a little bit, and if you don't catch yourself, you're going to, you know, face plant. There's your first step, and you kind of push off a little bit and steep leaning forward, and then pretty soon you have to catch that one. What are we doing? It's a step-by-step -step process, one at a time. This is it, walking in wisdom, step-by-step. Step. This step needs wisdom, this step needs wisdom, this step needs wisdom, and this step needs wisdom. It's those when you decide to put the wisdom in neutral for a little while? Fool, 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 fool. <laughs> wisdom. Oops. <laughs> That's just going, have you seen my wisdom? I had it here a minute ago. <laughs> you know, you guys like losing your keys, only, oh, okay. Continual step by step. Wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listening to what he's telling you. Practical application of knowledge is wisdom. Knowledge from knowledge you get understanding when you practically apply that understanding you get wisdom okay knowledge understanding wisdom folks you get those in the right proper order and man things go well listen to what the word has to say it's a practical application of knowledge doing it right and then it says to oh, outside that knowledge to those outside okay now who do you know that's outside the circles of the Christianity that you flow in? Oh, there's a few hundred thousand people that you come in contact with. Okay, wow. You've got to walk in wisdom toward the ones who are outside. Now, this backs us up to last week. If you walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, that includes your workplace. Any of you work with any fools? <laughs> Yeah. See, now, I just, now immediately, we all jumped into judgment right there. <laughs> yeah, well, we all look at this and go, oh, mercy. Well, if they're not walking with Jesus, they're fools. Just that simple. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
Actually, if you look at that in the, in the Hebrew, the word there is is an assumed. A literal translation of that is a fool said in his heart, no God. No access. Okay? You can put a comma in there. A fool has said in his heart, no God. <laughs> we could throw that one in there. <laughs> okay. Work, working with the Redeemer. Now, this is too fun. This is really, really too fun. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Wow, I love this idea. It's a time that we have been given. We have to redeem it. Now, when are you alive? You are alive right now for such a time as this. You're alive for now. God determined that you needed to be alive when things were doing what they're doing right now. It's not an accident that Daniel Wiebe is in our lives right now. This was a plan of God to get this man of God among us so we can share back and forth and learn from him and give to him. Yes. He was born for such a time as this. He is in this world right now for this time because God needs him in this place because he has special gifts that has to be in a special place to get done the things that God has for the world to have. He's important. He's vastly important to have around at this point. Now you can fill your name in that same blank. You are valuable. You are needed for such a time as this. Now Daniel is just slightly different in personality than John here. <laughs> just a little bit. And both of them are just a little bit off from Trey. Just just a little bit. I mean, they're like three peas in a pod, right? You say, now there's a pod you want to be careful when you open up. Okay? How different personalities. How different in backgrounds. How different in ways of thinking. Okay? You get those three guys together and they're all looking at each other like, well, what do we have in common? Okay? Jesus. That's the big deal. They're fun. They're all three absolutely and totally vi valuable and viable to be in this planet right here, right now. Amen. Amen. That's right. Okay, so are you. What's your plan? What is God's plan? You go, I don't know. That's right. That's where you have to trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We've got to have this together, guys. How valuable are you? You say, well, I'm not as valuable as don't ever go there. Don't ever say that sentence. Do not compare yourself with anybody. There's no way you can be compared to anybody. Because the first thing you're going to do is compare value, and you're wrong. You're not less valuable than anybody. Your value is still high. Do you do things different than that other person? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Now, I know hundreds of people that can play guitar better than me. I don't have to compare myself to them because when I'm playing guitar, I don't have to compare myself to them because I'm the one with the guitar in my hands. And I'm doing what I need to do, which is fun, okay? I don't have to compare myself to anybody. Interesting. Why do we place value system on anything? It's not the way it is. Jim is not Peter. Peter is not Jim. Amen. Praise God they are, they are different. Right? But they both have value, but it's in a different way and the different things. What God can use, what has he done in your life to bring you to the point where he can use you the way he wants to use you? You are so unique and so valuable. When we judge ourselves according to somebody else, that's just not, that's not, is that the way God determined it? No, the only way I can judge myself is according to, and even, what was it, Paul said, I don't even judge myself. Okay, that's not it. I have to look at what God is saying about me. That's very, very important. Verse 6. Oh, nope, nope, let's do this first. Redeeming the time. The word for time there is the Greek word kairos. Kairos. Now, this Pay close attention. This is really fun. Kairos means a specific time, whereas chronos in the Greek means all time. Now, you have probably around you somewhere a chronometer. 
okay? I've got this one, okay? I'm one of the few people that actually wears a watch anymore. Most people just, that's right there on their, on their, t their clocks, everybody on their, on their phones. Um, I, like, I like a watch. I like to know what time it is. What's this called? This is a chronometer. In fact, it's when you buy real fancy ones. Ooh, okay. Rick Whitehill had magazines, whole magazines on watches, on which one was that and all these. And just like, I went, nah, 35 bucks, I'm good to go, you know? Hey, fine. And so I was like, and he was showing me these watches that were just, okay. Are they more precise than your phone? I don't think so. I just, you know, whatever. But it's a chronometer. It measures all of time. There's no such thing as a chironometer. I don't know if that's the right word, that measures a specific time, okay? Maybe that's a stopwatch. I don't know. <laughs> okay. A rhema is translated word. That's a specific individual word, and the logos is the whole word. So you're showing a really big deal here. You have the rhema, which is specific, the logos, which is general. We have the kairos, which is specific, and the chronos, which is general which is really kind of fun because when the rhema and the kairos meet, when you have been given a specific word from God and you find out the specific time, oh boy. when you get the specific word and the specific time together, you have just reached critical mass. And that's when things happen. Okay? You've got to get the kairos, and you've got to get the rhema. And when they come together... Wow. Now, many of us have had rhema where God has told us what to do, but we didn't stick around long enough to hear the timing on it, and we tried to do something outside the timing of God. What do you get? An Ishmael. Okay, what happens when you, try, you say this is the right time, but you don't know what it is you're doing? <laughs> You've got to get the rhema and the kairos together. Many times we've got the rhema, we have to wait for the specific kairos and when the kairos happens, whew, what's it called? Faith. That's when faith functions, is when your kairos and your rhema come together. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. When that rhema hits the kairos time, wow, you're in the right place. Now, he's telling us to redeem the kairos, not the chronos. No, 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 no. See, I'm letting you think on this one for just a second. Redeem the specific time. Okay? Our church is in the point of selling. When it comes down to that, we were going to have to redeem the specific time of when that sells and redeem that time specifically. Okay? We're not talking about all the ages. We don't have control over all the ages, but we have control over every little bit of the rhema that God has given us. He tells us to do it, and we have to do it. And we have to do it at the right time. And when that time comes, whew, what's going to happen? Critical mass. Things blow up. I like blowing things up. Ephesians 5, 15, 16 says, Then watch. Whoa, I wonder what word that is. Gregor Yule. Yeah, there it is. But watch how carefully you walk, not as unwise, but as wise ones, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now that's big to us, redeeming the time. The days are evil. We can redeem the time, our specific time, even though the evil is going to continue. I can't change what the president is doing. I can't change what China is doing. I can't change what Russia is doing, what Israel is doing. I can't change any part of that. They don't even know I exist. Many of them are trying to destroy me without even knowing me. It's all really good. I can't change the chronos. I can't change all of that. But I can redeem the times in my life because the days are evil. I can redeem what's happening around me. I can bring the power of the Redeemer in everything I have going here. Isn't that too cool? Okay, we need to pay attention to how we walk. We need to pay attention on these things. It does make a difference to those who are in the darkness that see my light. What am I doing? I'm taking my change of the time around me and affecting a change there. I gotta make it. We have the wisdom in Christ. You'd think that we'd be able to use it, huh? The days of today 
are evil. <laughs> you think? <laughs> but we can affect the darkness that's around us. Guys, no fear. No fear. No fear. What happens if tomorrow Russia pulls off an EMP bomb and wipes out everything electronic across the whole United States of America? What's going to happen? I don't know. God's going to take care of us. Where are we going to get food? He's got a plan. Where are we going to get water? He's got a plan. Where are we going to get anything? He's got a plan. We've got to know that it doesn't matter. We have to have no fear, just wisdom. We've got to have it, guys. We've got to have wisdom. Then verse 6 says, Let your word be always with grace, having been seasoned with salt, to know how you ought to answer each one. Wow, this is fun. Let your word also, this is all your logos. Let your word, all your words be done in grace. Your whole total words, not just your specifics, but everything has got to be done with grace, having been seasoned with salt. Why? It says, if you lose your saltiness, how are you going to get that saltiness back? So you got to re you got to know how to take the real you of who you are and season everything you say with the real you not the false you. You got to season with salt. You're spicy. No, you have flavor. You have, you're, you make a change. What is salt there for? It's a preservative and it's a flavor enhancement. It's all sorts of different stuff. Salt's really good stuff. You die without it, by the way. Not judgment. Nobody wants to hear your judgment. If you're seasoning what you're saying with grace, you're doing it with grace, not judgment. Now, did you know that you're supposed to grace? It's not just God that graces. The Bible says that you are to grace. You are supposed to grace others. Meaning what? Not because they deserve it, not because they earned it. Not because you're feeling merciful. That's a whole other issue because mm -hmm. there's a difference between mercy and grace, which you're supposed to explain to me at some given time. But it says you're to grace them. Don't judge them. Give them grace. But it's got to be with life. I and mean, there's got to be stuff that you're saying. You know, we, we say stuff. How much do we say stuff is just fluff? fluff. Okay. But saying things smooth. Uh, I love, anybody here ever ask Eugenia how she is? You ever ask Eugenia, how are you? Blessed and highly favored. She said the Lord told her that she had to say that every single time. How are you? Blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Wait a minute, that's grace. Isn't that grace? Isn't that salt? How are you? Blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Okay. I love it when people ask me, how are you? I say, better than most. That gets a reaction out of people all over the place. They say, how do you know? <laughs> I love it when they ask that question. It is. It's a total <laughs> setup. Because less than 50% of the world are saved. I am saved. That makes me better than most. Easy. Just by being a Christian, I'm better than most. I can be falling apart at the seams and dying of every disease on the planet and still be better than most. Okay. I'm not going to be dying of every disease. <laughs> I am better than most. Okay. Acknowledging what Jesus has done for you. Acknowledging it. Let it come out in the way you have to talk. So you talk. When people walk away from you, I want them to be able to say, well, that was good. Not, wow, they're grumpy. How much grace is there in that? Right? So grace seasoned with salt talking the way you're supposed to because you're praying for how you're supposed to speak spiced with life but this says answer in word action attitude and work answer to know how you ought to answer each one which means what that means they're asking how do you answer something you don't answer something unless somebody asks when they look at you and go what is wrong with you it's a question I get to answer that question. <laughs> How are you today? Blessed and highly favored of the Lord? That's just a good question. That's a good answer. 
good question. Good question, too. Bless my favor of the Lord. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to everyone asking you a reason concerning the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that while they speak against you as evildoers, they may be shamed, those falsely accusing your good behavior in Christ. You see, you have to actually have good behavior in Christ for them to actually accuse you falsely when they accuse you because you're being a butthead because you are, okay, that's not falsely accusing. But when you're answering correctly, they'll be shamed because they're going against a f falsely accusing your good behavior in Christ. They must see the hope for them to ask it. If they don't see hope in you, they'll never ask about the hope that is within you. Meekness, fear, good conscience. Too fun. We are the only light that most people will ever know. We're the only Bible they'll ever read. Okay? But you're, you are. You're the only Bible they're ever going to read. They're the only one. That's it. We must pray. We must speak to those who are outside of who we are. We must redeem the times. We must live this 24-7. Every time you take a moment off, what are you doing? You were walking in wisdom, 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 fool, 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 wisdom, 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 fool, 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 wisdom, wisdom. Has to be consistent with the wisdom. We must live this 24 7. No religion, no religion, just relationship. I just love telling people, you know, I'm a pastor of this church. Oh, well, I'm not very religious. Me neither. I hate that religion stuff, Nick. <laughs> Oh, God, I hate religion. <laughs> Gee, that stuff just makes you sick, doesn't it? Just, oh, God, I hate religion, don't you? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so what's the mystery of the ages? When they see the glory in you, that's the hope that they're asking for when you're manifesting what God is saying about who you really are, because you are the glory of the Lord. It's too cool. So today, our, our, this is our passage. Steadfastly continue in prayer, watching in it with thanksgiving, praying together about us also, that God may open to us a door of the word to speak the mystery of Christ, on account of which I also have been bound, that I may make it clear, as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom to those ones outside, redeeming the time. Let your word always be with grace, having been seasoned with salt, to know how you ought to answer each one. He just said, now, we're praying for an open door. Then he told you how to do it when the door is open. Pretty slick. Pretty slick. Some really interesting practicals at the end of this chapter, the end of the book. Here, do these while you're at it. Is there something here that we can use? A little valuable? I think so. Using the power of our new man, using whatever position I have, father, husband, worker, friend, child, husband, wife, whatever position you have, whatever position I have, using it, shining out the glory of God. Folks, this is our hope opportunity, isn't it? And the best way of them knowing whether you have, have hope or not is where they see your peace. When they see your joy, they got to know, what are you talking about? Did you get something out of that this morning? Amen. We're just wrapping up one more. Only, I'm going to wrap up Colossians next week. So, it's all kind of crazy. So, all right. Are you blessed? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, today. What a privilege to have been in your house, to be here, Lord, knowing that you are working in our lives to touch us, to make us more than we've ever known ourselves to be, because, Lord, you are so much more, and you are living through us and to us and in us, about us. Lord, you are so awesome. We give you praise and glory. Lord, work this word 
into our hearts that we might be the ones to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And we thank you, Lord, for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right.